All right, hello YouTube. Uh, I guess this is technically an official face reveal for me. I am an avid herpetologist uh, coming at you with a just fun little chatting video. Wanted to try my first one of these and kind of see how it goes. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about the Digimon trading card game, why I enjoy it so much, and also why I'm starting to get a little apprehensive for the direction the game seems to be going, especially in the next couple of sets. This is in no way supposed to be a doomsday video. I'm not in any way trying to imply that the game is going downhill or anything of that nature. I definitely don't think that's the case. In fact, I think popularity seems to very much be ramping up, which is super positive. Um, but as someone who has played a lot of other card games in the past and still does... Um, play Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh! fairly frequently. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the red flags, I guess you could call it, that I'm starting to notice from some of the newer spoilers. Um, again, that's not to say that there's n I'm not in any way not excited about the new sets coming out, but wanted to kind of give a, a positive and negative um, discussion about the experiences that I've had with the game so far. Um, to begin with, I just want to again say a huge thank you. We just recently passed 50 subscribers on the channel. I think we're over 60 at this point at the time of making this video, which is already so much bigger than I ever expected this channel to get to. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to my friends, my family, and my wife for supporting me in this endeavor. It's definitely been a tremendous amount of fun, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's something new that I thought would always be fun. I've in the past thought about making videos, but it's been a really cool experience getting to make videos and the positive reception I've gotten from the comments from you guys watching the videos has been absolutely great. I uh, just want to say another big thank you guys and I hope you keep enjoying the content because I'm having fun and I'm probably going to keep posting videos. Um, so to get right into the meat of today's video, like I said, I want to start by talking about the positives. I think that there's so much positivity to be spoken of with the Digimon trading card game. It's so unique as opposed to a lot of the other card games that I've played. As I mentioned, I am an avid Magic the Gathering player. I actually started Magic the Gathering back in 2013, so relatively speaking, a fairly new player, I guess. Um, started right around the Theros Blocks inception. Um, in 2014, when Cons of Tarkir came out, is when I really started playing competitive competitive Magic the Gathering, getting into standard in the cons of Tarkir block, going to a pre-release was the first actual structured event that I had ever done, um, working my way up from standard through modern, played modern for several years, um, and then most recently and more of a legacy player. So kind of worked my way up the ladder. I also played lots of EDH, both casually and competitively. So done that for a long time, played plenty of Yu-Gi-Oh over the years as well, mostly going to more local tournaments. I uh, never really got super competitive into the Yu-Gi-Oh scene, but I won a couple of locals, you know, fun stuff there. Never really played anything meta, that was always, you know, my own stuff. But moving into the Digimon TCG, when I first was seeing spoilers for the game, it definitely looked interesting. Um, for me, any card game that I play, artwork is a big draw for me, and the artwork for the Digimon card game is, is phenomenal. I mean, anyone even who hasn't played the game before, you can look at the game and just see how beautiful the cards are. It really is a gorgeous game. Um, but the card mechanics and the way the game actually functions is also incredibly unique. Um, the memory system that you use to pass turns where it's less about choosing to end your, ter your turn and more about appropriately managing resources to make sure that on your opponent's turn they can't do as much because you manage your memory in a certain way. I think that whole uh, memory gauge system is super, super fun. It's very engaging and it makes the game feel a lot more dynamic to me. Um, Another really big appeal that I've had for this game since day one has been the community. The people that I've met online, you guys in the comments, as well as people that I meet in my local stores, uh, other big um, Digimon YouTubers, Twitch streamers have been huge and influential in getting me into the game and making sure that I'm interested in staying involved. The community has been super welcoming, super awesome, which is, I mean, let's call a spade a spade, not something you can necessarily say about the community behind every single card game. Um... <clears throat> Another really cool thing about the Digimon TCG, which of course may eventually end up changing as the game progresses, is that we're now on, at the time of this video, set 9. Um, so we've been through 9 base sets, multiple structure decks, as well as 2 special sets, EX sets, um, with EX3 currently on the horizon, as well as set 10 also going to be coming out sometime in the near future. Despite all of those sets coming out, cards from the first couple sets are still seeing relevancy competitively, which is really cool. That's not necessarily something, you, again, you can say about other card games all the time. Now, every card game, especially with great examples being Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic, there's going to be certain staples that are going to stick around. Um, obvious examples, 
Yu-Gi-Oh has Harpy's, you know, Harpy's Feather Duster, just simple example, a card that came out in, you know, the first couple of sets that still sees plenty of play today, but generally speaking, you're going to get cards pretty strongly power crept out. I'll talk a little bit about power creep in a bit if you don't know what power creep is, but the idea that we can see cards from even the very first set of Digimon still seeing good competitive play in the set 9 meta is really cool. It's it's kind of nice that this game has progressed in such a way that old cards are not just swept under the rug anytime that a new set is released. I really, really like that. That's a big appeal. Um, another really cool thing is that they have been doing really well about releasing new support for older archetypes. I mean, think about every time a new set is released, when we get new Yellow Tamers as a good example, Shine Greymon players are able to rejoice and celebrate because they get new stuff. Um, Greymon, of course, you know, again, be honest here, there's going to be certain archetypes that are going to be the fan favorites, like the the show-centric ones like Gabumon and Agumon, they're going to get the most support, and that's totally fine, but, you know, Greymon Tribal as, a, as an archetype has existed for quite a few sets now, and every couple of sets you'll get those new cards that kind of revitalize that archetype. Now, sometimes it's going to completely rewrite the archetype, like, for instance, again, set 9, we have the X-Antibody support, which is going to take traditional Greymon Tribal and turn it into Greymon X Tribal, which is fine. But the point that I'm getting at is that every time new sets release, you get new cards that kind of revitalize older archetypes. I'm, as you guys probably saw from my first video, am a huge Machine Dramon stan. So every set, knowing that there could be excuse me, new, uh, new black and red cyborgs on the horizon, um, new potential option cards and things that could get released to bring that archetype up to the next level is super exciting. It makes you really excited to see what's going to come out of the next set. That is... I I'll be fair here. So Yu-Gi-Oh! is unfortunately one of the big reasons I know a lot of people have kind of gotten away from that game is because a lot of the newer sets are going to be there just to push the new archetypes. And those new archetypes tend to be strong enough that... Sometimes when they get introduced to the game, they are so over-the-top powerful, they push all of the other archetypes out, which isn't necessarily a healthy dynamic. And I think, again, I think people realize that. And to be fair, again, Yu-Gi-Oh! has not always done that and is still not doing that every set. Yu-Gi-Oh! is absolutely still releasing support that can revitalize old archetypes. But I think nowadays, Yu-Gi-Oh! tends to more of revamp archetypes instead of actually support old archetypes. As a great example, one of my favorite archetypes from Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was growing up was the Armed Dragon line. Now Yu-Gi-Oh! has the Armed Dragon Thunder line, which is thematically very similar, but it's a powered up version. It's not using the old ones, the old Armed Dragon cards. It's making new Armed Dragon cards that are just powered up to whatever the current level is. Digimon has kind of gone the opposite direction with that thus far. Where, as I mentioned, you have like X-Antibody support, but that X-Antibody support is good because it uses support that was already there. The cards, a great example again, the very first structure deck that ever came out for Digimon, the structure deck 1, which was the red deck, had a Greymon, y'all know the one I'm talking about, which had a generic inheritable that just gives security attack plus 1. Not only is that card still relevant, that card from that first structure deck is an extremely expensive card. It's like $20, $25 currently. So being able to see older cards maintain their relevance is, again, super awesome. It's something that I like to see in a lot of um, the different aspects of the game. The other big thing that there is to be really happy about with the Digimon card game is they keep bringing out exciting new archetypes. Not only are they revamping old archetypes, but every set is bringing new iterations and new experimentation almost with ways to use the different colors and the different archetypes that exist already in the Digimon TCG. Obviously, each color kind of has their own set color identity, right? You're going to have red, which is going to be deletion effects, security attack plus one, DP gain. You're going to have yellow, which is destruction by DP reduction and recovery effects. You're going to have purple, which is playing out of the discard pile. So each color is always going to have that kind of thing that they are known to do, but they're still finding new ways to iterate on how they're doing that. And that to me is a lot of fun. I like what they kind of open the box up and expand on how certain mechanics work. As a perfect example, coming up in EX3, EX3 is a super exciting set. For those of you who aren't already excited, I am 
way over the top excited for this set. Not only as a Machine Dramon player, where I get to finally enjoy the benefits of the new Chaos Dramon, um, the uh, Hyper Infinity Cannon option card that's coming out, and the card no one seems to be talking about, the new Cyber Dramon, which is really awesome. Six to play, plus 2,000 DP on both turns. That's roll compression, which I'm a big fan of. So excited for all of that. But there's also so much else coming out in that set to be excited about. There's going to be um, Aegis Dramon. Aegis Dramon is going to be a super cool deck. It may not be top tier, but it's a deck that's going to be able to do things, and I'm really excited for that. I really want to make use of that deck. So I'll probably end up, look forward to it. I'm going to be doing a deck profile on that once that set comes out. That's one of the decks I plan on building. Um, but there's other really cool um, archetypes in that set. The new Hydramon uh, support. Green has always been about suspension and cheap digivolution effects, but the different ways that they have innovated on just the concept of suspending Digimon is wild. We've gone from suspending opponent's Digimon offensively with cards like Sarismon, all the way now up to where having your own Digimon suspended benefits your own team super well, like Shivamon. And now Hydramon seems like that perfect blending where, again, they're, they're, they're innovating and kind of twisting that formula into something new, and I think that's really cool. I really like that they keep pushing the envelope and finding new ways to use these otherwise very simple mechanics. I think that's super fun. But the primary reason I wanted to make this video, like I said, I wanted to get all the positives out of the way. There are so many positives to talk about with the Digimon TCG. I wanted to talk about some of the reasons that I'm starting to get a little bit nervous about the future of the game. Now, I want to make this as a disclaimer. All of these are my opinions. You don't have to agree with them. You may think they're all completely wrong, and that's totally fine. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I just kind of wanted to use this like a little video diary and just kind of talk about the things that I'm starting to notice that may be a little bit of a red flag where a couple sets from now it could potentially get worse to the point that, I don't know, we ca it could cause some more problems if, if it's not handled properly. Um, the primary thing that I want to talk about is power creep. I mentioned power creep a little bit earlier. For the power, those of you who don't know, power creep is the general concept of as card games, using card games as an example here, it really applies to a bunch of things, but as card games progress from one set to the beginning, when they start, as they progress and different sets are released, basically the overall power level of the game is going to increase. Now that's something completely normal. It's, it's honestly natural and you should expect it if you're getting into a game. In order for that game to stay relevant, it has to have some level of power creep. Otherwise, why would you buy the new packs? The new decks or the new archetypes or whatever that is being pushed by these new packs, there needs to be a reason for you to buy those packs, right? So they're going to slowly increase the power level. Now, the power level increase can be gradual in the sense that the new decks come out and are competitive. However, old decks are still able to compete. And then there's power creep in the sense that the new decks become so far ahead of what came before them that they're the only things that can compete. You basically are left with a situation where you are either playing the new hotness or you are playing something that specifically counters the new hotness. This is a dangerous position for card games to be in, and it's one of the reasons that people have gotten really frustrated with the other you know, big card games recently. Um, Magic the Gathering has had a lot of power creep issues where new cards such as the notorious Oko Thief of Crowns have been printed, and they kind of make a lot of the old cards irrelevant because they are so over-the-top powerful. For the record, I will never let this go. When Oko was first spoiled, everyone laughed at it and thought it was a joke. It wasn't until that card actually started seeing play and people realized, oh, hey, okay, yeah, this is way more powerful than we thought it was. And the card literally warped entire formats around itself to the point where it's literally banned in everything aside from EDH as of making this video, which is pretty wild to think about. But it's just an example of how card games can go from gradual power creep to rocketing forward to make cards super powerful, super fast, and how that can potentially be bad for the balance of the game. The reason that I'm mentioning this is specifically two reasons in particular. Um, one of them is a particular card that just got released in BT9 called Death Exmon. The other one is general gameplay that I've started to see from decks in the EX3 set. I'm going to talk about each one of those. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about Death Exmon. I mentioned in my Machine Dramon video, I actually run Death Exmon. So this is coming from the perspective of someone who is already using the card. It's not like I'm upset because I can't afford it. I have the card. I just don't like the card. And I don't like the card for a couple of reasons. I think the card does way too much for way too little of an opportunity cost. What I mean by that is we've had lots of powerful cards in the Digimon TCG up until this point, and still in this set, there are a ton of powerful cards. 
even something you could easily consider more powerful than Death Exmon. Um, Alphamon or you can great example card is super super strong it's topping lots of events but I'm not calling for that card to get banned I'm calling for Death Exmon to get banned or limited or something and it's more to do with the generic nature of Death Exmon what I mean by that is up until this point a lot of the other powerful cards have been I think a good way of putting it is archetype specific basically you need to build a deck around those Digimon in order to get the most out of how their effects work Shine Greymon is a great example again. Shine Greymon is a card that's been out for a very long time at this point. When it first came out, it was very powerful, um, did really well in a lot of events, but in order to do well with Shine Greymon, you had to have a deck built to take advantage of Shine Greymon. So in order to build Shine Greymon, there's an opportunity cost. You need to have a lot of tamers in your deck to get the most advantage out of that. That brings us to Death Exmon. Death Exmon, unfortunately, is a Digimon that really doesn't require any build around. There is really no opportunity cost to running this card. Period. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. So Death Exmon is a 20 to play Digimon with 15,000 DP. It's a level 7. The pro <laughs> This is the first problem with it. You can reduce its play cost by 3 for every Digimon and Tamer your opponent has in play. What that basically means is... If your opponent just has two Tamers and two Digimon, just four bodies total on the board, you are already playing it for a reduced cost of 12. That means you are playing a level 7 Digimon for 8 memory. That is really, really strong. And that's just a, a minor example here. You can easily play Death Axemon for less than that. Let's say that you are playing against a deck with lots of Tamers, and they have a four Tamer setup plus a two or three Digimon in play. You can already be playing this for 5 memory or less. I actually had a game just the other day, and by my own admission, where I was playing my Machine Dramon deck. I had a pretty solid start of 2 memory tamers and 2 Digimon in play. My opponent swings into my security, checks another tamer, that enters play. That's 5 bodies on board. They slap Death Exmon down for 5. That pretty much put me out of the game. And I'm, I'm not saying this to be salty, I swear that I'm not. Again, I play Death Exmon too. I'm able to have games just like that. I don't like the fact that this card is generically powerful for no opportunity cost. You can stick that in anything, and as long as your opponent is playing the game, you slap it down for nothing. Not only does it have such an easy play cost, but when it comes down, it does so much. It has an on-play and when digivolving effect, where it comes down, de-digivolves your opponent's entire board by one, then wipes everything that's level 4 or below. Which means unless you've X digivolved on a level 5, you are wiping the entire board, assuming everything that was level 5 and below is, is, is just gone. You wiped everything except Megas, and now Megas are all level 5. That's wild. That shouldn't exist. I'm just going to be honest, that shouldn't be possible. Um, and then, just because the card doesn't have enough text, on the end of each of your opponent's turns, you also, just for nothing, for no price destroy the lowest play cost Digimon that they have, all of them. So if they have multiples that are three drops, all of them are gone. That's just so generically powerful. I really, really don't like that kind of gameplay. I honestly am hoping that this is kind of an, ex an exception to the rule. I'm hoping that Death Exmon is one card that just made it past the RNG department without being properly tested or something. I don't know. But I'm really hoping we don't see more cards like this. The games aren't fun when they're dictated by generically powerful cards that everything can run. A great example is going to come from Yu-Gi-Oh! Where we have... A great example is a card that recently got banned. A card called Predaplant Verte Anaconda. This is a card that is, technically speaking, belonging to the Predaplant archetype. Which is actually a very cool archetype. The members of that archetype are really, really neat. The archetype itself has some cool mechanics. Doesn't see any play, though. The only card that saw play from that archetype was Predaplant Verity Anaconda, with some exceptions in the past. Yes, there were some fusion um, engines and things like that, but recently, most recently, Anaconda was really the primary thing that was seeing play. And the problem, the reason that it was, is because it didn't require uh, materials of any specific type. It didn't require Predaplant materials. It took any material, any kind of monsters you can use to make this card, and then, again, generically, you can use it to dump a fusion from any other archetype. Most commonly, for the longest time, what you would see was two monsters of any sort make Predaplant Verte Anaconda, use that to dump a card called Red Eyes Fusion, which makes a Red Eyes Black Dragon archetypal 
boss monster that doesn't see play in its own archetype, but would be the thing that other decks would end on because it was so generically powerful and you can make it without having any opportunity cost. So that's kind of an example where I'm coming from. I'm hoping that Digimon is not going in that direction. I would really like to see them not go in that direction, but we'll, I guess we'll see as the further future sets comes out. Currently, there are two sets coming after BT9, and there aren't any other cards that seem to be going that route. I'm hoping we're going to stay that way, but I did. now that Death Xmon is out, we knew coming from a while that Death Xmon was going to be a potential problem for the format, and I'm not saying it's breaking the format open or anything like that. I'm not saying that. Just want to make sure that I make that perfectly clear. I'm not saying Death Xmon is ruining the game for anybody, not even myself. I'm, I'm perfectly fine playing with it in existence. I just don't like that design space. I don't like that that is a generic card that any deck, literally any deck, can just add a copy or two, and it doesn't take away from the deck at all. I just don't think that's super fun. Um, the other example of general power creep that really was kind of the catalyst for me wanting to make this video um, was the general power level of some of the decks that are starting to come out, specifically in the new EX3 set, uh, Draconic Roar. Um, if any of you are familiar, there's a really cool Digimon channel on YouTube called Card Protagonist. If you haven't seen Card Protagonist, I highly recommend looking them up. They make some really nice, high-quality gameplay videos that kind of showcase a lot of the new archetypes as they come out. I have personally have been really excited for seeing their EX3 deck gameplay because, as like I said, it's a really cool set. I wanted to see these decks in action. Well, one of the more recent videos was a deck of the new Purple Red Imperial Dramon versus the Four Great Dragons archetype. Now, the Four Great Dragons archetype, I think, is actually really cool. It's an example of another really interesting design space where they took the idea of yellow, turned it on its head, and just kind of gave it this really fun new gimmick. I think it's super cool. It's like Megazoo for the modern era. I really love that idea. Imperial Dramon is a little bit of a different story. So if you watch their gameplay or even just read the Imperial Dramon archetype from Vimon, Wormon, um, Flame Dramon, Shah Dramon, Pyil Dramon, Dino Beamon, Imperial Dramon Dragon Mode, Imperial Dramon Fighter Mode. The cards are basically designed to warp Digivolve from a single champion Digivolution all the way up into Fighter Mode. That is not something we have ever seen before, and even though it does take a decent amount of setup to make that combo work, again, this is something that I consider a bit of a red flag. If you watch their video, and again, I want to make sure I make this clear, my problem has nothing to do with card protagonists. I think their channel is phenomenal. The problem is the deck that's being showcased. What those cards are able to do is a little scary. Basically, what happens is if you have the proper graveyard setup, you digivolve into either Flame Dramon or Shah Dramon. The fact that they both do it is also part of the problem, but I'll get to that in a minute. So they both, let's say you digivolve up one of them. Their effect is on digivolve, you can then digivolve the other one from your trash, and then they both have an effect where at the end of turn, so if you pass turn by doing this, they can DNA Digivolve immediately. Okay, we've we've kind of seen that already. There's cards that do that. You know, Purple Yellow Gatomon has that effect. Green Wormmon has that effect. For the most part, that's fine. The problem is that when they DNA Digivolve, Pyildramon and Dino Beamon also share similar effects, where they can bring the other one back from the trash. You DNA Digivolve into Pyildramon, you get a free Dino Beamon from your trash straight to the field. And again, they share this effect where they can just DNA Digivolve straight up, and then they go into Imperial Dramon. Now, Imperial Dramon is another good example of power creep. The level of power that you get from Digivolving up into that is a little frightening. It's You Digivolve up into it, and you basically make your opponent sack down to one Digimon. Then you get to Blitz, and you get to swing into whatever Digimon that's still there. And then you can go into Fighter Mode and get even more pluses. Like It just, the, it just keeps going in all of this is catalyzed just off of Digivolving one champion. And yes, you need to have graveyard set up in order for this combo to work, but a little bit of graveyard setup in purple is not that big of a deal. You're going to get there pretty easy just by playing the game the way you normally would. So it's one of those things where I just, I've got a really bad feeling, like if this is the way that decks are moving, I, I'm very concerned for how quickly we're going to start ramping up that power level to the point where older decks are not going to be able to compete. How do you compete with something that is able to go off off of just such a minimal board state. That to me is a big red flag and it's just something that I wanted to talk a little bit about because it is very concerning. Um, another great example from EX3 is the new Examon deck. The new Examon deck is very similar. It actually, to be fair, requires a little bit more setup where you have to have you know certain level fives in play. But even then, the level fives share effects 
that say you can treat these level fives as a level six Digimon to DNA Digivolve into a level seven. So getting into your level seven is so much easier and it's basically free. Like that's, that's so much less investment than level sevens have needed up until this point. It's one of those things where if you're going to do something like that, there needs to be some kind of a hindrance or something to kind of hold that archetype back from being too over the top powerful. And there's really nothing that I can find about this archetype that does that. Examon is an incredibly powerful card by itself, and I think it would have been fine if they had just let the level 6s be the DNA sources. There were other ways that I think they could have gone about DNA digivolving into a level 7 that could have made it more balanced. Or Dynemon is, again, a great example where you have Regelmon. Regelmon is, I think, a perfectly balanced card for making that kind of mechanic work. You have to be behind to the point where you have one or less security to hard play it, and then get its DNA Digivolve effect for free. But you're doing that for a memory cost of 12, and you have to be basically close to death in order to do it. You have to be close to death without actually dying. That's what we call an opportunity cost. In order to make it work, you have to go through these hoops. They're starting to remove the hoops, guys. And I gotta say, that really scares me. I'm not looking forward to how these decks are gonna look if they keep going this route where they have less and less requirements in order to create these incredibly powerful board states. Um, another big thing, and this is really, to be fair, kind of the last big major point that I wanted to talk about, because this is, in my opinion, one of the ways that Bandai can kind of prevent these decks from getting too over-the-top powerful. I think we need to start having a little bit better regulation on the ban list. Now, I know this is probably not much of a hot take. From what I've, the people that I've talked with, I don't think the Bandai's um, Digimon ban list is... I don't think it's necessarily fair to say unpopular. I think the bans they've done are perfectly fine, and they've handled very problematic cards before they became a big problem, but they've also let cards go that could probably use a handle that they just kind of let run rampant until they run their course. Uh, this is, again, a, a probably a big topic of debate I know recently is the recent limiting of Jet Silphimon and Tommy. These were two cards that were big, big contenders in the meta Excuse me for a very long time all the way back since BT7, where they were basically the dominant force of the meta. Yellow hybrid and blue hybrid, even even until the ban, were still extremely dominant. Um, they were past their prime, I, would, I think it's fair to say, but they were still competing. And they basically waited up until the point where they were kind of on their way out of the format. Maybe that's not necessarily fair to say a blue hybrid. Blue hybrid may still be around for a while, but they let these cards basically dominate the format for way longer than I think a lot of players would have preferred. A lot of players were stuck in, pardon my language, blue hybrid hell, which is basically just going to locals and being stuck playing against blue hybrid round after round after round. That is a very quick way to get your player base burnt out. That is an identical reason that I know currently the Magic the Gathering legacy format is starting to see a decline in popularity. The ban list hasn't been super well maintained, and the bigger problem is there's just new cards that enter the format that just don't really get touched until they've been too dominant of a force for too long. Blue Red Tempo, those of you who play Magic know what I'm talking about, Delver Shells, are still that force that is just omnipresent, and it's something that they still have not been able to effectively handle, even after all this time. It's, they're taking the approach of ban the new threats until the next new threat comes out and just makes the decks dominant again. So I'm really hoping that we're going to start seeing Bandai adjusting and maintaining the ban list for Digimon a little better. Now, I do think that there is a, a, a balance to be struck here. I'm not in any way implying that we need to, every single set, we need to be banning everything that tops. I'm not saying that. I want to make absolutely clear again, that's not what I'm getting at. But there are going to be situations where, like I said with these new decks, where they're able to do things that are so over-the-top powerful that it is going to push old decks out. And again, that is something that's going to happen eventually. That is the nature of power creep. But when power creep is done correctly, it's inviting new decks in without shutting the door, or rather slamming the door, on the older archetypes. I want to see things adjusting gradually. I want to see arch I like seeing archetypes that come out that encourage the use of older cards. The Igastramon archetype is another great arc uh, example. There's lots of older cards, like there's a Gomamon from an older set that, when played from Digivolution sources, draws you two cards. I love seeing that these older cards that have seen no use up until this point, they suddenly have a use because new cards have come out that support them. That's a lot of fun. And of course, there's going to be new archetypes where they are self-contained. 
The new Imperial Dramon deck that was around in BT8 is another great example. That is a deck that was self-contained. It was pretty much the archetype that was made. It may have run a few older cards, Davis being one of them, but for the most part, it was the newer cards. That's fine. When Imperial Dramon came out, it was a strong and powerful deck. It didn't make other decks irrelevant. There's a reason that Tommy and Jet Sophie got limited after the inception of that deck. It's fair, it's strong, but it's balanced. It's the lack of that balance that I'm starting to get a little bit worried about. And this may absolutely just be me overreacting and being a Debbie Downer, whatever you want to call me. It could absolutely be that. It's just, like I said, these are, these are just some red flags that I've started to notice. I'm still very, very excited for the, uh, the future sets that are coming out. If you're keeping up with the new set 11 uh, spoilers, you may have noticed today, Waru Seedramon got spoiled. I'm a huge Seedramon line fan, so I was super excited to see that. And not only are they making new Seedramon support, they're even making it support the Igerstramon archetype, so I'm super excited for that. I love that they just keep pushing some of these rogue archetypes. Tyranimon, I'm still waiting on the Tyranimon X archetype support to come out. Super excited if they ever decide to make that, but... Like I said, guys, these are just some basic thoughts. I just wanted to air them out there for you guys. If you guys agree, be, please feel free to like uh, and comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these kinds of things as well. I think having these discussions is very healthy. I think it's important to be able to mention things that we're worried about, um, things that we enjoy about the game too. That's why I wanted to make sure I did mention at the start of the video. There is so, so much positive uh, energy and stuff that comes out of the Digimon card game. It has been such a wonderful experience getting to learn the game, and getting to learn the people who play the game. I love all you guys. Please hit me up in the comments if you guys ever want to play games over webcam sometime. I am more than happy to play with you guys. I think the game is so much fun. Um, now that I've hit 50 uh, subscribers, I'm looking to start doing live streams. I'm not going to get too much into it, but I've got some fun projects scheduled. I've already got a, a weekly idea set up for um, a weekly live stream that I think you guys are really going to like. I gotta see if I can find some people to back me up and join me in that endeavor before I'm going to make an official announcement on what we're going to be doing. Um, but just know that I've got some other fun ideas coming down the pipeline, and I love hearing from you guys. If you have any suggestions for other videos, things that you want to hear me talk about, decks you want to hear me cover, I'm happy to hear those suggestions, so please leave them down below. Anyways, guys, that's pretty much it. Just wanted to give a quick little chat video. So uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your night, and I will see you next time.